Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, the largest budget in state history approved. What's inside and why another session of some sort could still be possible. Plus, he is, I think, part of the majority of Russians were kind of staying silent um, because they don't actually know what's going on. A Russian-American here in New Mexico doing what he can to promote peace and keep people informed. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham is using executive action to kickstart her plans to make New Mexico a hub for hydrogen power. In less than 20 minutes, we'll break down what's inside. And our line opinion panelists react to one company announcing plans to invest more than $250 million in our state. Later on, environment correspondent Laura Paskus explores a possible tool in the battle against ongoing drought, weather modification. Two scientists explain how the decades-old practice of cloud seeding can bring rainfall to areas that otherwise may not see it, and how it's helping parts of New Mexico stay hydrated right now. But first, a look inside the largest state budget in New Mexico history. The governor approved the $8.5 billion plan late last week, but not without eliminating some wish list spending from the legislature. Let's get to the line to break it all down. Hello and welcome to this week's Line Opinion panelists. Thank you all for joining us this week. Now, first, we're happy to welcome back Line regular and former New Mexico State Senator Diane Snyder. We're also glad to have Laura Sanchez with us. She's an attorney and longtime Line regular. Thanks for being here, Laura. And a warm welcome back to Steve Terrell, retired Capitol reporter for the Santa Fe New Mexican, of course. It's great to have you all with us. As you might imagine, there's quite a bit of quite a bit stuffed into this 8.8 8.5 sorry billion dollar budget for the fiscal year 2023, but it's what's not included that's causing some controversy in Santa Fe. Democrats in the state house and Senate say they're still considering a plan to override the governor's veto of a 50 million dollars she says circumvented the budget process. Some of that money would go towards initiatives like senior center programs, children's behavioral health services, and increased court staffing. Now, Senator Snyder, you've been involved in budget negotiations in the past, a lot of them. First, what do you make of the mm -hmm. governor's veto decision? What's, what's your, your, your absolute, what, what's your first thought here when you, saw, when you saw that veto? I thought it was a mistake that it was silly to do, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you do a little research. She, this, this is what we call House Bill 2 Jr. Mm -hmm. it's, it's things that, and what the process somewhat is loosely de described is there's X amount of dollars that the House is given and X amount of dollars the Senate is given. And each legislator is then given some amount mm -hmm. to give and spend as they choose. It is, it is vetted overall by the House appropriations and Senate finance, but legislators get to decide where that money goes. This, and they have recurring monies and non-recurring monies. And so this is the bill that was vetoed. It was, there were some line item vetoes in the budget, regular mm -hmm. budget, mm -hmm. House Bill 2, but not, but she just flat out vetoed all of House Bill Junior, uh, the ju budget junior bill. Mm -hmm. And if you look back, there's only been one other time when a governor's veto, when they re resulted in an extraordinary session called by the legislators themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say I was a part of that historic moment. It was back when it was either my first or second session. I can't remember exactly, but Governor Johnson vetoed the entire budget. Well, you can't, uh, our constitution requires us to have a budget. Right. So you, we had to do something. And he, his demands where we thought as legislators were somewhat unconventional and, and not necessary. So we called ourselves into session and and processed and created a budget and everything went well, according to uh, starting on July one of that fiscal year, mm -hmm. year. So it's I just felt like one other quick thing. A lot of times in the Albuquerque area or major metropolitan areas, it's not as well known which legislator gives you the money for your senior center or for a road or, or, or things like that. But in the rural areas, they consider that very, very important mm. because 
everybody knows them and they know who and they run for reelection mm -hmm. on what they've given not so much in Albuquerque particularly. So it's very important to rural areas. And that's why you're seeing a lot of crossover, both Democrats and Republicans advocating or standing ready to do uh, an extraordinary session. Steve, so oh, I'm, I think I'm watching eagerly. It's, 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 it's a fascinating moment, uh, Steve Terrell, that you know I, I very much appreciate what Senator just set up for us. But we got a lot of Democrats who are out there threatening this extraordinary session, one called by the legislature, of course. Uh, poss possible? Where does it sit right now in, in your view, Steve? Um, well, the, every day I read something and it seems like it changes day to day. Right. Um, I read a Monaghan uh, blog post uh, earlier this week that said probably it's not going to happen extraordinary but see there's also talk by the governor of calling a special session right. mm -hmm. uh, for um, gas prices and um, somehow i think it could be a face saving type deal mm -hmm. so she won't be the second governor to get an extraordinary session call I, uh, that was one of my first sessions too that i covered uh, senator snyder and i yeah. just like you i was baffled by this thing i it, it seemed um, the Santa Fe New Mexican had an editorial that uh, said the governor has a weird propensity for offending her allies. Right. And uh, this uh, not only just stuck it to the Republicans, but also uh, Democrats. So it's like a bipartisan. She's she's bringing unity to the legislature, but probably not in the way she wanted. Uh, Laura, Laura, I cannot remember a time I've seen so many Democratic state representatives with so many very tough quotes about a sitting Democratic governor. It, it, this is an amazing thing. I mean, I'm talking some high profile folks, Roger Montoya, Patty Alonso. I mean, these are, these are not, you know, you got Rod Montoya saying, the, he, you know, these actions will have, quote, grave and consequential impacts on seniors, youth in rural and tribal communities, veterans, nonprofits. What, what was gained here? So I want to remind us all that, uh, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened in terms of high profile Democrats criticizing the governor. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget John Arthur Smith, who with the moniker Dr. No, or, or, you know, Dr. No, who said no to a lot of Bill Richardson's initiatives. And there was there was uh, no love lost bet between those two high profile Democrats. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is uh, unprecedented in New Mexico. We we see a lot of this. And you know, an election um, that is, uh, you know, critical for, I think, the state and in terms of the overall direction of the future is, is going to bring a lot in terms of uni unifying the parties um, once we get past this, this turmoil. But, you know, in terms of what was gained, I mean, I think that from the governor's perspective, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for her in terms of from her perspective, just uh, shining a light into the process. I think for anybody who's not familiar with the way that capital outlay tends to work, the fact that there is this junior junior bill, mm -hmm. um, this this is an area that's I think ripe for criticism in terms of how these decision, decisions get made. So I think perhaps is this the, is this the time to make that point for the governor though in in an election well, year? You know, some of it may be trying to um, gain some traction with folks who are critical of just people in the know in the in the in Santa Fe, mm -hmm. maybe trying to shine a light into transparency. That could be an angle. But on the other hand, from the um, legislators point of view, I mean, this is how it's been done for years. I think that um, Senator Snyder's point is well taken that especially in these rural areas, you know, the this what may be a very small amount in Albuquerque or Santa Fe um, it could be huge for a local community center, a youth yep. center, a recreational area, a park. These are things that are really, really important for some of these rural communities. And so I think it's going to ultimately end up being very difficult for um, for the governor to to just sort of stay on this track. There's going to have to be a compromise made um, on all sides mm -hmm. to figure out how to get past this impasse. You know, Senator, when you've got folks like I mentioned, Ms. Lundstrom, with quotes like, quote, come on now, give me a break. <laughs> I think legislators know what's best in their own darn communities and they should be able to fund some of those smaller projects. That's pretty tough stuff right there. It is tough stuff. And yet, and Patty's right to uh, Representative Lundstrom, pardon me. The thing is, I went through the list yesterday. It took me a while to go through, but on the legislative website, it gives you every line item that was funded doesn't tell you who funded it, mm. but it does tell you who it is. And I didn't find anything that I thought inappropriate for okay. those kinds of funds. Mm -hmm. um, 
I like the fact that they had some uh, uh, recurring ex expenses funded by recurring monies, which is always the wisest thing to do. But the thing, uh, one other point I want to quickly make is there is a great bit of discussion, at least on the Republican side, is if you're planning on putting in a whole lot of other items, we don't want an extraordinary session mm -hmm. and we don't want the governor doing that. Interesting point there. Steve, let me wrap up with you on this. Um, the controversy won't affect what is, is included in the budget, of course, a big chunk of spending going towards increased pay for public employees, teachers, police. You know, how important was it to get those pay raises passed quickly and smoothly, and now you know, we've got this other stuff to deal with? Well, it's, uh, like others have said, I, it, I, I think it's a mess that uh, mm -hmm. there's a veto caused. Um, it, um, I, I think most of that stuff will eventually get approved at a special or extraordinary session. But, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, I think it was a needless uh, thing. And you're talking about the process. And, uh, yeah, I agree that the um, capital outlay process does need to be more transparent. And there probably mm -hmm. are a lot of reforms needed. But as Gene, you kept saying it's an election year. And I think the voter down in some rural community that wants a new senior center, they don't give a flying darn about uh, the uh, the election, you know, the uh, process That's here. Right. That's right. You know, it's uh, they're saying, why did she veto that? Why? Um, it may be a tempest in the teapot. It may just all be corrected. But uh, then again, it's going to take a, some kind of a new session to mm -hmm. do it. And we're going to wrap this up here. It's, the irony is interesting when you think about it, how the governor is sort of positioned there. There's better ways to distribute money. But this was the same governor, of course, who tried to distribute money coming out of the federal government and it ended up on our Supreme Court about who gets to spend the dang money. Okay. It's all very interesting. <laughs> all right, thank you for your thoughts. There's some governor's... speculation oh, sorry, that uh, the veto was like revenge for that. Right. That's right. It's that speculation. Right. I don't know. The line will be back in about 15 minutes to talk about the governor's executive action on hydrogen. But before we get into that, we want to turn our attention back to the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine and the response to it. Here in New Mexico, Americans, Ukrainians, even Russians are coming together to oppose the invasion and to support peace. Colores host Ebony Ice's booth spoke with one of those concerned citizens. <laughs> There are Russian voices opposing the war in Ukraine and doing the work to ensure that those voices are heard. Grisha Gutkin was among those protesting at a rally for Ukraine in Santa Fe this past weekend. Grisha, why were you there? The, the first uh, uh, part of the answer is that I organized the rally. Uh, and uh, the reason that I organized it is, you know, I am I'm from Russia originally. I came here when I was a 12 year old boy. Um, so I have kind of a split identity between my Russian and my American um, parts of my identity. And, um, you know, when the, the war broke out in Ukraine, at first, you know, I was shocked and, and saddened. And um, for a while, I just didn't know how I could help. After reading uh, a message from, um, uh, Navalny, who is a jailed uh, opposition leader, um, calling for Russians to come to the streets uh, every Sunday and protest the war. Not just Russians in Russia, but Russians everywhere throughout the world. I, you know, I thought that this was this is something that I could do. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, I think almost 100 people showed up, and uh, you know, we want to just keep it going and promoting kind of solidarity with the Ukrainian people. And um, I think Americans are definitely not for this war, but uh, it's important to, to, to note that not all Russians are for this war either. Grisha, how do you talk about what's happening right now? I mean, I talk to different people. Uh, I talk to my wife about it all the time also. She's a very deeply caring person. So it's, it's, it's very upsetting to both of us. So we help each other process it. Um, just talk about the daily events of what's happening. 
Then there are people that I have in Russia, including my mom, who still lives there. Uh, they've been difficult conversations because, you know, she, she gets a different view uh, of the events. You know, she, she obviously think she's horrified by what's happening it's you know it's brother killing brother and, and all that but she where we don't kind of see the eye to eye is who is who caused the war she just doesn't see it as a war of aggression she sees as as you know what official propaganda says it's the war of liberation uh and so i you know as one of the examples to counter that i said well did you see what happened in mariupol and then the maternity ward that got bombed well, and she said, well, the way that they showed it to me, to, to us, is that uh, this was all staged. They were, there was a, a blogger actress who actually acted out in, in those videos. Uh, and yeah, there wasn't really a maternity. I mean, it used to be a maternity ward, but it was taken over by uh, the, the fighters. And uh, yeah, the people that you saw that were, you know, escaping it, they were actors. And that kind of, I haven't heard that theory yet. So I was just kind of dumbfounded. So yeah, so uh, that is to say, you know, the conversation with my mom is, is I'm trying to educate her on what's actually going on, um, but it's hard. It's, it's an uphill battle, uh, I think, you know, and, and she is, I think, part of the majority of Russians who are kind of say, staying silent um, because they don't actually know what's going on. And, and, and if they do get some, you know, um, facts that are not in the official narrative, they're, they're afraid. What can be done right now? I think what we can do is just, you know, show support to the Ukrainian people, help people that are in need. Um, there's like over 2 million refugees that need, you know, financial assistance. I think battling the propaganda uh, and especially Russian speaking people, if you have connections with your folks back in Russia, you know, I know it's hard to talk to them sometimes, but I think it's our duty to kind of let them know what's actually happening because they're the people that are ultimately responsible for electing their government. And if they, you know, decide that, you know, they had enough of Putin, they had enough of his, like, 20 years of dictatorship, then they can actually change things. What is it like to be someone that's born and raised in New Mexico? I don't know what that feels like, but I'm very fascinated with that. Thanks again to Ebony Isis Booth for that interview. You'll see more from Grisha coming up in the next episode of Colonus here on New Mexico PBS. More than a month after the state legislature rejected several plans to create a hub for, in fact, for hydrogen energy here in New Mexico, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham issued an executive order directing members of her cabinet to work towards building a hydrogen economy. Let's bring the line panel back in to talk about the latest development in this saga. Now, as of just a few weeks ago, the plan was to use a form of hydrogen derived from natural gas. But in that executive order, if you noticed, the governor used the terms, quote, clean and zero carbon several times. In less than 10 minutes after the governor's announcement, Universal Hydrogen, a company devoted to, quote, green hydrogen, end quote, announced a deal here in Albuquerque. Now, how does this change the perception of this hydrogen push? Let me start with Laura Sanchez on that. What's changed for you when you consider hydrogen? Anything different here after the governor's executive order? Well, I think that it's important to um, think back to where we were at the time that the ETA was being talked about. And that was, um, in my opinion, that we needed an, you know, everything on the table approach to mm -hmm. addressing climate change, but also addressing our energy needs the in old the state. President and Obama about, approach, right. Right. And it was about a transition, right? And I think part of the part of what I see is um, this this the criticism that a lot of environmentalists have about this hydrogen approach um, is that they're you know they, they've addressed largely addressed a lot of the coal, um, obviously the coal burning and the CO2 from that. And now they're shifting to all fossil fuels without really considering um, what that means for a lot of communities in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. There has to be a just transition. And that was a big part of what the ETA was about is including a just transition. 
Um, and so for these, what the governor has looked at, along with other states um, in, the, in the region, and using or leveraging federal funds, um, is to try to figure out a way to transition into cleaner energy, but also continue to support communities that have that as a resource. And I think as we see right now what's happening um, geopolitically around the, around the world, obviously with Ukraine and all the problems with, with gas and, and so forth, you know, we're, we're increasingly connected um, worldwide and resources that we have in New Mexico are still um, viable for addressing some of the um, not just environmental issues, but also addressing some of the supply issues around the world. So I think it's important for us to consider that, you know, it isn't as black and white as some folks would like to, to, to think when it comes to this issue. The other thing to consider also is that one of the big problems that environmentalists, and I think it's a reasonable concern uh, that environmentalists have about hydrogen is that there is a byproduct of methane or there, there's potential methane escaping. And that's overall a concern with um, oil and gas production. But there is also technology that could be brought in to detect more methane um, escaping, as well as uh, trying to do more differentiated gas, meaning that you're trying to make sure that the production all throughout the process is done in a cleaner manner. And I think that's those are the kinds of technologies that we have to have um, to make sure that we're transitioning well into the future. And uh, the best way to do that is to leverage federal funds to be able to develop those kinds of technologies. So I think this is a smart um, uh, approach. Uh, but it's very politically, obviously, difficult to do right now. Smart approach, Steve Terrell. I mean, the governor had a whole year to let us know what was up. Her thoughts could have brought us into the process. Environmentalists, legislators, everybody could have been. But no, right before the session, she decided to drop this bomb saying we're going to have this new hydrogen hub. In hindsight, was that a smart way to go about this if it was so huge and the, the, the potential so big? L bent for hydrogen. That's our new state motto. Right. Um, no, I agree. No, I agree, Gene. I, I think that um, yeah, she could have uh, done a better job of preparing uh, everybody for this, especially the legislature. I mean, the thing was uh, when you see uh, Jerry Ortiz, Pino, and Jim Townsend voting the same way. You know, there's uh, <laughs> talk about uniting the legislature again. Right. Um, you know, she's not the only politician here, not the only Democratic politician who's pushed uh, hydrogen. Uh, yes. Senator Martin Heinrich yep. has, too, and yep. Senator Ben Ray Lujan. But uh, uh, Senator Heinrich brought up an interesting fact at a uh, hearing, uh, I think in February, a, a, a congressional hearing, uh, this blue hydrogen, which depends on national uh, natural gas, um, there's all this new technology uh, uh, going where you know, it'll be much cheaper to produce the green uh, hydrogen. Mm -hmm. But if we're investing all these millions of dollars in uh, blue hydrogen, it, in a, which could be, you know, within five or 10 years uh, priced out by the green hydrogen, you know, is that really a, a wise move? I, I think this thing really needs to be looked at um, by serious people and not just... Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, this political back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know, Senator, I was had a chance to interview uh, Secretary Granholm when she was here in Albuquerque, or in New Mexico, not just Albuquerque, when she was doing the big hydrogen push to kind of get this thing going. And she really kind of made it clear that New Mexico was right on the brink of something. So you can't blame the governor, certainly, for seeing something. But it's a process question. I, I, you know, that's what I'm asking here. What The process just doesn't seem like she's able to get everybody on board Am I missing something here? Does she need everybody on board here? I think what you're missing is the $18 billion that are coming from the feds. That's right. Uh, <laughs> one of well, the, Secretary Granholm I, made that very clear, believe me. Yeah. Eight, eight I, billion, I, by I, the way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, eight? Mm -hmm. I thought it was eight billion. Eight, never mind, it's a lot of money. And and mm -hmm. we're in the market to have some of it. Yep. I, I have a couple thoughts. One is that maybe she was keeping it close to the vest while she was negotiating with the other states to try, which we now have the agreements with, mm -hmm. to make it more palatable and more eligible for funding mm -hmm. from the Fed. I think that's one thing. Did it come at a bad time? Because and, and I think she was somewhat taken aback, I was a little bit, that she got so much pushback on it. 
And then you start reading into it. And as Laura and Steve have said, you understand why that was occurring. Mm -hmm. But then there's a part of me that goes, okay, did that pushback come from uh, the reasons they give? Or is it once again, the age old uh, fossil fuel industries against the environmentalist? How much of that played into the discussion and the rejection of the bill, right. because it would it would use and certainly with all the natural gas we have in New Mexico, mm -hmm. it would we're the natural partner with the other states that are involved in this compact with her. So, I to me I'm still sitting on the outside going, okay, lots of money, lots of jobs, a step toward cleaner energy mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Why why all this pushback? against it right from for her and her moving forward to do it interesting so there. and i think and i think sometimes you have to be a true leader and step up and say guys you, you took the wrong turn on this one so we're gonna go mm -hmm. i don't laurie your so, thoughts on that i have a question for you but i'm interested yeah. in your follow-up yeah, to no, what senator no, just mentioned i mean look Timing is everything, right? And in a perfect world, the governor would have given plenty of time like everybody else does when it comes to shopping an issue during interim committee meetings and then prepping it for pre-filing and then actually having it introduced and then talking about it. But here's the key. When it comes to those federal funds from the Department of Energy, the announcement on the, that clean hydrogen hub funding, infrastructure funding, didn't come out until February 15th, 2022. If you look at, if you if you just Google that part of it, the DOE announcement on the, that hydrogen hub infrastructure funding came out February 15th. So, I mean, I think there was obviously talk well before that from DOE about something being in the works, but until it's officially announced by DOE- But, she, but you don't the, know the Secretary of Energy out. was here. The Secretary, way before February of 2022. He was, but that doesn't mean that there's an actual opportunity that's that's open until it's officially announced. And that occurred on February 15th. And that was right before the end of session. Mm -hmm. So I think that the timing needs to be explained a little bit better, could be explained a little bit better as to why this happened the way that it did after the discussion on the actual legislative aspect of it had already occurred. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a, a reason for that. We have to, we're, we're kind of at the mercy of what the federal government is gonna do with regard to that infrastructure funding. Yep. And there was obviously a lot of delay on that this year. We'll be watching this developing story over the coming weeks and months, no doubt. Along with that appeal in the proposed Avangrid p and merger, <laughs> that's in there too. Thanks to our panelists once again. We'll check back in with them in about 20 minutes to talk about the organized effort to keep the Democratic Party from inching further left. As drought continues to worry the state's farmers and ranchers, some are trying to find a fix by modifying the weather. Correspondent Laura Paskus caught up with two people at the center of this project. Gary Walker's company has filed an application for cloud seeding, and Hannah Risley White at the Interstate Stream Commission evaluates weather modification applications. Now, here's how they both see this process moving forward, both in the short and long term. Gary Walker, thanks so much for joining me today to talk about weather modification. You're very welcome. So you're the co-owner of SOAR, which stands for Seeding Operations and Atmospheric Research. Um, for those of us not familiar with the technology, can you kind of give us the big picture overview of, of what this sort of weather modification is? Weather modification goes on in more than 40 countries in our world. Water is an issue for all of us, and uh, uh, the United Nations even predicts that by 2050 that uh, most countries uh, in our world will have water shortages. Um, weather modification is a tool that's been in existence for well over 50 years. I spent 30 years uh, as the manager of a water conservation, two water conservation districts in Texas. Um, and the depletion of the Ogallala aquifer was one of the main drivers behind my involvement with weather modification. And so in the agricultural areas of uh, the Panhandle of Texas, the South Plains of Texas, the Eastern New Mexico uh, portions uh, there in your state, uh, the groundwater depletions uh, and declines are, have been a very big concern for, for producers uh, 
uh, cities as well for many, many years. So you're working with meteorologists and watching forecasts and you get those suitable clouds. Kind of what happens next? What's the process? In the summertime, we're looking for those cumulus type clouds that uh, have liquid water in them and the airplane will uh, go into the go into the air and, and go toward the cloud identified by that meteorologist that will have suitable liquid water in it and we will disperse an ice crystal type nucleate in that cloud and that 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 uh, synthetic ice crystal then will uh, be attracted uh, to the water particles those minute water particles and then they become heavy enough to fall out as a raindrop clouds are generally uh, fairly inefficient uh, and that's why cloud seeding does work there's a lot of a lot of moisture in the atmosphere a cloud is not like a pitcher full of water and once it pours out it's just empty the atmosphere um, suitable clouds that are seeded at the proper time uh, research uh, has shown that those those clouds last longer and produce more rainfall because that atmosphere continues to uh, keep that 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 cloud uh, uh, more or less in a constructive uh, phase. I know the state of Utah has been doing this for a while. You mentioned California. I'm curious, you've been doing this a while. Is there more and more of a demand for these types of services as more people are really seeing the effects yes. of drought? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, again, it, it, cloud seeding is not the silver bullet. It's not going to end all droughts in all countries. Uh, but just like so many other things that we have that that enhance either our computers or enhance our gas mileage or whatever, um, we can enhance the rainfall and and the value of what I call a return on investment many, many times is uh, minuscule compared to what it costs to either build a pipeline or dig a new reservoir. Uh, those things take lots and lots of time. And so not to say that we shouldn't be concerned with conservation and reuse and even new supplies uh, such as they have available on the coastal areas of our country uh, and other countries for desalinization. So I imagine that you spend a lot of time talking with people who are pretty worried about the drought. Um, I'm curious if you could, you know, talk a little bit about what you've seen change over the decades when it comes to drought and, and people trying different things or new things. Yeah, well, I, my last 25 years as a water district manager was right up across the eastern side of New Mexico in, in the Yoakum County area, Plains, uh, Denver City area. Our water declines in the aquifer there many years uh, was as much as two to three feet a year. Um, so a lot of those areas, um, Laura, they may only have uh, 20, 20, less than 30, 40 feet of saturated thickness left in the aquifer. Um, pretty easy to, you know, to divide that by two and figure out about how many years that you have left to irrigate. And so we can extend the life of the aquifer a little by, by producing um, some additional rainfall. Um, not to, not to even talk about the the savings and the pumping costs for agriculture, and of course our our ranching community. I mean, they're they're tickled to death to have a, you know, have a half inch anytime. But uh, it's certainly important for the for the production of our irrigated acres. Well, Gary, thanks so much for talking with me. I really appreciate it. And here's hoping we all get some good clouds this summer. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, we, we hope so as well. Hannah Risley White, thanks for joining me today to talk about weather modification. Thanks, Laura, it's a pleasure to be here. So when we're talking about weather modification, what activities are we actually, like, what do those encompass? 
largely that encompasses either ground-based or aerial-based cloud seeding, usually using silver iodide or calcium or potassium chloride. And the idea is to put tiny particles in the sky under exactly the right conditions to help induce droplets to form to increase rainfall. So this isn't something that's necessarily new in the state of New Mexico. Um, procedures for the state to evaluate and potentially approve these projects are codified in the state's Water Quality Act, is that right? So yeah, actually the Weather Control Act was passed in 1965. Um, and we at New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission were only tasked with evaluating applications for licenses for cloud seeding um, in 2003, the legislature moved that responsibility from New Mexico Tech to us. And so just to be clear, we aren't necessarily proponents of it, but we are tasked by statute with evaluating applications for cloud seeding in New Mexico. So one application for um, a proposed project in northern New Mexico was recently withdrawn. Can you talk a little bit about what that project would have been and kind of what happened in the process? Sure. So in October of last year, so 2021, we received an application for a license from a company called Western Weather Consultants. They would be the actual um, entity that would have conducted this particular project that was um, ground-based cloud seedings. This would have been a project to induce additional rainfall over the Sangre de Cristo Mountains through ground-based cloud seeding using silver iodide. Um, they, however, were not the project sponsor. That was so Roosevelt Soil and Water Conservation District, which received in the 2021 legislative session funding for cloud seeding specifically. Um, but we got a tremendous amount of interest in that application. One of the requirements in our process in New Mexico is that any um, application for a license for cloud seeding has to be noticed publicly in newspapers. We received over 250 protests associated with that particular application. Um, so lots and lots of interest in it. Um, and we're, we're glad to see that people care and are concerned about water issues in New Mexico. Um, as you, I think, know, we've also been working on the governor's 50 year water plan over the last year. and so. Um, hoping that some of the folks whose attention was caught by the cloud seeding efforts might get interested in that process as well, given the sort of scarcities that we're facing. Do you anticipate or does the state anticipate getting more of these types of applications? Is this something we're going to see more of, you think? You know what? I would not be surprised, um, given that we're in the third year of a, a significant drought across the state. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, doing this work on the 50 year water plan, you know, the, the anticipated increasing scarcity to our water supplies across the state is significant. We're looking at a 25% reduction in water supplies by 2070. So I think people will, um, you know, continue to have quite a bit of interest in cloud seeding. I should also mention that in receiving the application that we received last fall for the Sangres, and in looking at this current application that, you know, we um, have some thoughts at the staff level in terms of potential changes to the rule, the weather enhancement rule, um, which is what governs how these applications are handled. We also heard pretty loud and clear from folks last fall that, that they'd like to see some changes. For example, protests have to be received in writing. Um, and within certain time period. And so I do think, and we flagged for our commission at our last um, Interstate Stream Commission meeting, that they should anticipate some change, potential changes to the rule um, coming this year that would make it, bring it into the 21st century a little bit, make it easier for folks who, who care and want to engage and also streamline the process for us. So you mentioned some really stark numbers there. Um, and I'm curious because, you know, looking at the current application before the state, um, you know, they note that industry standards suggest that a 15 to 20 percent increase in rainfall is likely over a normal summer seeding season of four to six months. Like that seems like such a slim, you know, like a slim chance that we're taking. But is the water situation in New Mexico such that we're just trying to grab at any tool or possibility um, 
like how big of an impact could weather modification really have? Um, I mean, I think it can be successful given certain, just the right circumstances. So um, from my understanding, even that 15 to 20% increase is, 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 you know, in the under exactly the right conditions, right? So um, I think, you know, what's been interesting as part of this 50 year water planning effort is there's a lot of folks who look to solutions that involve increasing supply. So that could be cloud seeding or interbasin transfers or all those types of things. Um, in my opinion, a lot of those are, are challenging and expensive. And sometimes where you, you actually get the biggest bang for your buck is conservation, right? So how do we look at how we're using the water that we have now in our existing basins and, and use it more wisely? And probably ultimately the solution will be some combination of all of those things, lots of tools in the, in the toolbox. Um, but certainly more work needs to be done on a basin by basin um, basis and with the water users and stakeholders in each of those basins to think through what are the solutions that make sense in each of those regions, given the scarcity that we're facing. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that cloud seeding is some silver bullet that will solve all of our problems by any means. Yeah. But it could be a part of it could be a part of the solution, um, especially for communities that feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Well, Hannah Risley White, thank you so much for talking with me about this. It's a really fascinating topic. You're so welcome. I'm happy and thanks for having me. Thanks to environment reporter Laura Paskus for that story. We reached out to the Roosevelt Soil and Water Conservation District. That's the group trying to use state funding to do the summertime seeding, but they didn't respond to follow up questions to talk. Let's bring back the line panel one final time to recap the Democratic Party's pre-primary convention. With Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham as the unanimous incumbent, the race for AG was the headline. State Auditor Brian Colon won the majority of votes. And Laura, let me ask you this, is this an important race for Democrats? <laughs> Absolutely, I think yep. this is a key race. Um, uh, Democrats have held that seat for um, several terms, uh, you know, going back obviously qu quite quite far, and it tends to be a stepping stone to other um, positions. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Udall obviously went on to become um, senator. There's been others that have that have gone on from there. Gary King was attorney general, but did did not successfully um, was not able to be uh, governor. But others have, and so I think it's an important race. But more importantly than that, there's also so much crime in the state, right. and there are so many issues um, that the, uh, in terms of the consumer division, the utilities division, there's other areas of the attorney general's office that are super important to New Mexicans. So I think this is a key race. Mm -hmm. Steve, interestingly, two weeks ago we broke down the Republican convention here on the show and eventually made our way to the question: Are these pre-primary conventions useful, or just an added opportunity for a potential PR gaffe? Well, I was very happy that both parties held their uh, pre-primary conventions in the state this time. Oh, that's right. Rather than going to Amarillo like the Republicans did last year. Forgot about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess maybe there's some business that the parties need to take care of, uh, you know. Um, but choosing uh, who's going to be on the ballot, it, it's just a useless exercise. You mentioned Gary King a minute ago, Laura. Um, I remember when uh, the Democrats had their pre-primary back in uh, 2014, Howie Morales, who was a state senator at the time, just swept it. And coming in very last was Gary King. Huh. Yet somehow a couple of months later, he won the nomination. Now this time, uh, the Republicans uh, went, uh, uh, who's the guy who won? Uh, oh, it's Commissioner Block. And Mark Ronchetti, right. who's probably the best known, got less than uh, the amount needed. I think he got 10 percenters. I, I, I forget his percentage number. Mm -hmm. But if anybody thinks that he's not going to get better than that in the in the primary, you know, you're crazy. Uh, and um, and um, it, it just seems uh, useless. Uh, you know, he's going to be on the ballot anyway because he got. Uh, right. Petitious signatures, mm -hmm. and that goes for all the Democrats too. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like a, you know, kind of a pep rally type thing mm -hmm. that's ultimately useless. You know, Senator, there's some value in the pep rally. Of course, it sort of like kicks off the season. We all get to see each other, breathe each other, you know, all that kind of a thing. But again, at the end of the day, what are they worth for for candidates? 
uh, a pep rally. That's all I see them <laughs> as. Uh, you know, you get to stand up and say, I'm the most wonderful. You should vote for me. Um, I, I don't think I, I can, I will always remember the Gary King situation. That's the one that most vividly, mm -hmm. but I, I was trying to think, and I've talked to several people. I can't remember exactly when was the last one, unless they were a outstanding or a unanimous candidate where they went on to win the primary. Right. There's two things on thoughts on my part. I, I just think anybody who wants to run for office should be allowed to do so. And that pre-primary conventions traditionally are full of the party faithful, the right. advocates, the stronger of, of them. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see that as always reflecting the entire mental attitude of the rest of the party. Yes. So I think that that's something that gets missed. And I think that's a little deceptive for the ones who win mm -hmm. is they I mean, I bet Howie still thought he should have won that race, but it didn't turn out that way. I so, think he came in third. Yeah, yeah. something like yeah. that. So, the thing is, and, uh, uh, the, uh, just quickly, the other thing I learned is that in 1972, little history here, is the Republicans had Senator Domenici running for Senate. That was it. Didn't have a problem, no, no question. He won the pre-primary convention. But the Democrats had 32 candidates. And shortly there, thereafter, wow. it was changed and the law put in place that, that adjusts. And I'm not sure that those numbers are exactly correct, but it was a whole bunch of people on the Democrat side. And so the pre-primary convention was put in place. And that's back in 1972. So it sounds like, it's, it almost sounds like an Albuquerque mayoral race back when we used to have yeah, 15, 16 you know, candidates. I, I, let, I Senator, let, let, let me jump in, Senator, real quick. I, I appreciate it. We're just a little short on time on this segment. Sure. I, I want to I ask uh, Laura something here real quick. As we digest sure. this results from the convention, we're also learning, guys, about a, a new pack from an Albuquerque City Council, Luis Sanchez, backing what he calls moderate Democrats in contested races. Now, of course, this seems to be part of a nationwide trend in the Democratic Party, but Laura, is this the right play to win seats in at a state like New Mexico? Well, you know, that's a good question, Gene. I, I, it's not the first time that there's been an effort to try to, um, to have more moderate Democrats um, elected. But as you said, it is a nationwide trend. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, Ocasio-Cortez in New York, there's a lot of efforts to try to get a more moderate person in that seat than, mm -hmm. you know, the far left that, that she's been perceived as. Um, I think in New Mexico, part of the concern is that places like, for example, Deming, my hometown, where you have John Arthur Smith, um, a progressive group went down there, unseated him in the primary, basically got a more progressive person in there, and now it's flipped Republican. And the bottom line is that it's going to be very hard to get that Republican out of that seat without a whole lot of effort. So the problem that, that I think Democrats need to understand is that if we continue to elect to only get the most progressive, and this goes for the Republicans too, the most, um, you know, those that tend more towards the far extremes of the party, then when it comes to the general, you're going to have a real tough time um, getting the base and especially those declined estates to vote for that same person. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where this is coming from. What's interesting to me is that you have um, the folks involved that you do. Luis Sanchez is definitely much more moderate, former police officer, new yep. to the city council. But then you also have James Hallinan, who's working on this. He's no political novice. I mean, he's been around for quite a long time as a political person. Mm -hmm. He's also involved and, in, you know, I somewhat hate to bring this up because I think there's both two sides of this, but he's the one who had the complaint against the governor right. um, about sexual harassment during her campaign. And then there was a payout from the, from the, uh, from her campaign um, on that whole thing, which to me as a lawyer settlements just don't necessarily mean um, guilt. Um, it just means that it needs to be settled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's going to be a very interesting pack to watch and an interesting season, but I do want to say with regard to the pre-primary, I think there's still a lot to be said for a candidate getting up in front of a big crowd, whether it is the party faithful or not, and being able to say, this is why I'm running for office. Mm -hmm. And that 50 year old example you gave Diane is really, or Senator was really important. I mean, to have 32 people running, Ten seconds, I mean, how do you please. even begin to figure out who the right person should be? So it's a vetting process. Good points there, I'm glad you got it in. Thanks again to the line panel, oh, awesome as always. All right, be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. 
In our final segment of the night, we turn back to Colores anchor Ebony Ice's booth. She recently interviewed filmmaker and photographer Frank Blasquez about his YouTube documentary series, Duke City Diaries, telling the stories of people born and raised in the city of Albuquerque. How did the Duke City Diaries documentary series come about? Duke City Diaries started as a way to explore the city of Albuquerque and the people within it. But one of the main reasons it started was a lot of people were asking me about my subjects and my still photos and my portraits. And they were asking me, who are these people? Where, where do they live? Where do they come from? Do they know this person? I think I know that person. What do they do? And I'm like, you know what? I don't really know, but maybe I should start to ask those questions to the subjects themselves because rather than me answering those questions, it should be the subject answering those questions for themselves. So. What happened when you engaged Carlos around taking his portrait? I saw Carlos at UNM, on the UNM campus. He was just driving around and um, I saw he had two different colored eyes and that's kind of like a portrait photographer's dream, right? You see, a, you see someone with two different colored eyes and you're like, hey, you know what, that's, that's really striking. I have to capture that. He actually said no at first, but he gave me his contact info. So I was just going back and forth with him over like several months. And then um, he finally said yes. He's like, you know what, just come over to my house. We'll take some photos. And I was like, thank you so much. Thanks for letting me do this. And this was at Carlos's house here in Albuquerque that I took this portrait. What about Carlos's voice resonates with you? When I took this portrait, Carlos gave me a little bit of his story about growing up here in Albuquerque. So I felt that it would be very fitting for me to do a short documentary on his life. And that's what happened after a, a, about a couple weeks after this portrait is when I did one of the first um, short documentaries where I had a subject speak for themselves outside of a still image. And Carlos said uh, he, he witnessed his father uh, die by gunfire from a police officer that, that shot him because his, um, his stepfather was holding his brother hostage. And I do not know what something like that would feel like. I've never had that type of experience, but I knew that an audience might be able to connect with that because there's other people that might have lived through similar things with domestic issues or mm -hmm. family things that um, I really can't touch base on that because I haven't lived through it, but I might be able to find a subject that might be able to speak on that. And I think that's important to create that connection. What is important about creating that connection? What, uh, does, it, what does it do? I think it makes someone feel a little bit more whole having that connection with someone knowing that they've lived through that exact experience. It's, it's just that, that basic feeling of, hey, you know what, that person's done that thing or that person's been through the same thing that I went through. I have a connection with this person. I feel like I know this person and I have a little bit more comfort and I feel a little bit more warm. Um, I feel a little bit more at, at home now because I, I know that I'm not the only one that has to deal with something. So I think that's important. It's, on the process of, I think, with, with healing and things like that. And how do you get them to share and tell you, invite you into their world for these stories to be shared? It's just simple questions, asking them different things that I would just ask like a family member or a friend, like starting with a certain memory that maybe is relatable. Where did you go to school? What was it like dealing with this situation with your family member? I kind of have the same feeling with this and that and what's your take on this. So it's a lot of um, asking questions in a conversational manner that's really not imposing, but in a way that invites someone in in a, in a gentle manner and then just letting it do its own thing. So can I get an example maybe of what that conversation looks like? Like I want to take your picture and turn you into a documentary <laughs> subject. Right. What's an example of that? Yeah, I think. Um, it's a process, for sure. Sometimes my subjects, they're, they're kind of iffy about it, and you know I don't want to force anyone to do anything, so I'll kind of ask them, hey, you know what, I think it's important that you explain what it's like to be New Mexican, because that's kind of the like, overriding theme that always pops up is, what is it like to be someone that's born and raised in New Mexico? 
I don't know what that feels like, but I'm very fascinated with that because I live here in this beautiful place. Um, you, the, someone that's been here forever, what's it like? What are some of the hardships that you've had to deal with along the way? Right. So that, that's kind of like the main thing that, that always pops up is being New Mexican. Like that's the main cultural identifier. Like I said before, it's like I've asked my subjects this, like, hey, like, what's your culture? What's your ethnicity? Me thinking that they're going to say Latino or Hispanic, the first thing they say is I'm New Mexican. And I never saw that before in different states. I used to live in Chicago. I never heard someone say, oh, well, first and foremost, I'm a Chicagoan or I'm from Illinois. Like, it's right. really interesting that here that that's a primary um, or that's one of the main ways that people, that some people identify with their space here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you plan on continuing the Duke City Diary series? Uh, no, it's, it's actually done because <laughs> okay. I've done a lot of stuff here in the city and I'm actually starting to go to different places in New Mexico, not just Albuquerque. So I've done stuff in um, Artesia where this photo was taken from. So um, Artesia, I'm starting to go to different places around like the U.S. Mexico border, so like parts of El Paso, which kind of bleeds into New Mexico. But since I'm going to different locations, it wouldn't be fitting to use Duke City Diaries since that kind of is like uh, only for Albuquerque, right? It's Duke City, so. But maybe, who knows, in the future, if, if I do something in the city again, it, it could be brought back, so. What's yeah. next for you, Frank Blasquez, and what should your fans be looking out for? Oh, thanks. Um, some of the things that are coming up would have to deal with my fine art photography, with my still photography, with my portraits. I'll be at the Smithsonian in April of 2022. Um, that opens up at the Outwin uh, Triennial Portrait Competition. So that's one of the next things that are coming up uh, for my fine art portraits. For my movies, I'm working on um, some different subject matter uh, within the state of New Mexico that deals with um, crime, incarceration, uh, stories that deal with people that are um, in prison right now that are dealing with those things and uh, what that's like specifically here in the state in New Mexico. So Much respect to you for the triumph of healing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks a lot. It's a shame we've gotten to a politicized place on the hydrogen opportunity for New Mexico. The main reason in my estimation is because the governor never really made a here's what's in it for you appeal to the voters. Now she had a year plus in which she could have been having a dialogue with the public, business, legislators, all that. Now compare this to the film industry, which spreads money statewide. The hydrogen hub opportunity is not that widespread by its nature. Now there's the 500 jobs slated for Albuquerque and that's great, but the real focus will primarily be in the Four Corners and at that old facility in Pruitt. But apparently Alvin Grid, the firm who had their overture to p and rejected by the PRC, somehow also stands to gain before they even have a deal. At some point soon, it will be nice to know who this hydrogen hub is going to be good for beyond industry and corporations. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.